Today we're going to, by God's grace, look at the subject of untwisting the meaning of but for the grace of God. You've heard people say that all the time. Ooh, but for the grace of God. Go oh, on. But many times it's just a phrase that's just thrown around. There are people who do not necessarily believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. He will say, who but for the grace of God. Or they may say a statement similar to this. They may say, who God saved me from a car accident. It was real bad. Who he, mu he must have something he wants me to do. I don't know why he saved me, but it must be something he wants me to do. And our answer to that should be, no, it's not something he wants you to do. It's something he wants you to be. He wants you to be a believer. Because of the patience of God means salvation. Therefore, you can't do something until you first believe something. And in order to believe something, God has to plant the ability to believe in our hearts. And if you're a believer here this morning, I, I, I just give you, I give you the liberty to say thank you because he planted it in your heart. Go right ahead. Thank you. All right. Because you can't say that at the mall where malls are closed anyway. <laughs> you can't say that everywhere. People look at it, what's wrong with you? It's not what's wrong with us, it's what's right with us. And what's right with us is Jesus Christ and him crucified. Let's go to Jude, verse 1, chapter 5. We're going to pick up where we left off last week. Now, I want to remind you, though you know all these things, the Lord first saved the people out of Egypt and later destroyed those who did not believe. Now, in this passage, we see two types of grace, two types of God's grace. First, there's the common grace where God saved all of Israel from physical bondage. Everyone came out. But then there's a second and more important type of grace, which is the saving grace of God, where God chose to save some from spiritual bondage. When people in the world say, oh, God saved me, but for the grace of God, they can say that because God saves the wicked from the consequences of their sin. He did that to Adam and Eve. He said, Adam and Eve, if you eat of the fruit, you will surely die. Did they die physically? No, they were still around. He told Cain and Abel, Cain and Abel, Cain killed his brother, but God showed grace towards him. He put a sign on him that if someone saw him, they would not kill him. Our God is gracious even to the unbeliever, but there's only one that really counts. Amen. Now, there, as we discussed last week, there is a group of beings that God chose not to save at all. And that's in verse six of Jude one. And he has kept with eternal chains in darkness for the judgment of the great day. The angels who did not keep their own position, but deserted their proper dwelling. Now, remember, they these were the angels that cohabited with with women and they had children. And God, he, he punished them by putting them into the abyss. Now, here's a question for you. Did these angels suffer injustice? No, because they got what they deserve. God is never guilty of injustice because if there's one person that God has to save, then his mercy is no longer mercy. Think about that. If something is owed, it is not mercy. But if something is given freely, it's mercy. And out of God's mercy and his grace, he saved you. How great is our God? How great is our God? Sing with me. How great is our God? Now, we saw this occurred during the time of Noah. Man's wickedness was, was rampant. I guess it would be just like today. You know, people used to say, oh, New York City is a wicked city. Russellville is wicked too. Amen. Amen. Everywhere. I don't care where you go. Sin never takes a vacation. It may go to a vacation spot, but it will not take a vacation. So what did God decide to do? Genesis 6, verse 7. The Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land 
from man to animals to creeping things and to birds of the sky. For I am sorry that I have made them. Those people say, God was sorry, God regretted. This is an anthropomorphic, I'll say that again. It is an anthropomorphic statement wherein we talk about God as if he were a human being. So we know God is spirit. God does not regret anything that he does. God, he has a plan. He's going to carry out his plan. But they were talking about God, the, the creator, that he was sorrowful over the sin of man. God hates sin. He hates sin as sinners and he hates sin in you and he hates sin in me. Now, in other words, the sin of man grieved God's heart. Um. I don't want to get too personal with you, but uh, do you grieve God's heart? Don't be too slow. Yes. <laughs> yes. We grieve God's heart. The word tells us do not grieve the Holy Spirit by which you were sealed until the day of redemption. Isn't that good news? So we shouldn't do it, but that doesn't mean we're not unsealed. God, mm, there's no one alive today who can break the seal that God has on you. I'm so glad about it. The old songs, I'm so glad. Jesus lifted me. Sing glory. Hallelujah. Jesus lifted me and he lifted you to stay lifted. Now, but for the grace of God, no one would have been saved. God said, I'm going to wipe out all mankind. But for the grace of God, no one would have been saved. This takes us to Genesis 6, verse 8. But Noah found favor. What is favor? Grace. What is grace? God's commitment to save. But Noah found favor. Grace. God's commitment to save in the eyes of the Lord. Noah was a righteous man. Why was he righteous? Well, people say, well, he was a good man. Yeah, he was righteous. But uh, did God choose him because he was righteous? No, because no one could be righteous on their own. God showed favor on him and by his grace, he became a righteous man and God showed favor on him. That's the saving grace of God. It was oper operating in the Old Testament and praise God is operating in the new. God committed himself to save Noah, both physically and spiritually. Genesis 6, 18 says, but I will establish, establish my covenant with you, you who, Noah, and you shall enter the ark. Get the list here. You and your sons and your wife. And your son's wise with you and all that you convince to go into the ark. Doesn't say that, does it? He said, you, your sons and your wife and your son's wives with you. Thus Noah did. No, according to all that God had commanded him so that he did. He did everything. Why did he do it? He did it by grace. Through what? Faith. Noah believed God. And what did he do? He built a boat. Why? Because he believed and all who believe shall be saved. Isn't that what the Bible says? That was the case with Noah. Now, verse seven of Jude one gives us additional insight into the saving grace of God. In the same way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them committed sexual immorality and practice perversions just as angels did and serve as an example by undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. The destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah foreshadowed the fiery judgment that will take place at the end of the age. Whenever you see something happening in the Old Testament, you have to understand it is a foreshadowing some way of Christ. In this, it foreshadowed the judgment that Christ is going to place upon the world at the end. Isn't that what's going to happen? You read Revelation, fire is going to come. That's what it said. It's going to be fire. Now, once again, it's amazing. Once again, we see God's common and saving grace at work at the same time. Genesis 19, verse 15. When morning dawned, 
the angels urged Lot, saying, Up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away in the punishment of the city. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. The, these angels who, were, who came as men were speaking the word of God to Lot. Now let's see the effect. Verse 16, but he hesitated. Wait a minute. If he truly believed God, shouldn't he have flown out the door and the suction of him leaving carry everybody else out? Shouldn't that have happened? No. But he hesitated. Oh, let's see the grace of God in action. So the men seized his hand. I like the way that sounds very poetic. They say they grabbed the man by his hand. They, in other words, in the vernacular, they yanked him. So the men seized his hand and the hand of his wife. Get that? Did you get? Don't let that pass you. Because everybody talks about her turning. We know what happened to her. But what did they do? They, they seized the hand, his hand and the hand of his wife and the hands of his two daughters. Oh, that's going to get interesting in a little while. For the compassion. What's the compassion? The mercy and the grace of the Lord was upon him. Both kinds. And they brought them out and put him outside the city. Here we see the common grace that God saved the whole family from destruction. Did he not? Then he also saved some spiritually. He saved all physically, but he only saved some spiritually. In unbelief, Lot's wife looked back, didn't she? Why did she look back? Because she didn't believe. She didn't believe. If she had believed, she would look, she would look forward. But who didn't look back? Lot and his daughters, did they? They were saved physically, but they were also spiritually saved because they believed. Okay? Okay. Now, how in the world? You might be saying, Dana, how in the world can you say that Lot and his daughters were believers. Second Peter, you know, they, 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 we know what they did. Didn't Lot get drunk? Huh? Didn't his daughters make a scheme? Well, first of all, let's not go to, did Lot and his crazy self offer his daughters to the men outside his door who were wanting to sleep with the men inside? Did he do that? I don't care how you slice it. That's crazy. You see, the mind, we say, I said, how great is our God, right? Okay. So in our human thinking, he would have been disqualified from ever being called righteous. He would have been disqualified in our minds. Not only that, the daughters were just as crazy as he was. They concocted a plan after they saw the city was destroyed and said, hey, there's no men around. I guess we got to get daddy drunk and do what we got to do. And that's what they did. But they were believers. This is the point. Because of the grace of God, even God saves. He causes us to believe. But believers can do some crazy things. What happens when believers have gone wild? What happens? Well, we sing the song. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than most of our sins. Don't shout me down now. Grace that is greater than... Oh, oh, come on here. You see, by God's grace, they were believers and all of their, their nonsense 
and Lot's nonsense and Abraham's lying nonsense and David's adulterous and murderous nonsense were placed upon Jesus Christ on the cross. It didn't go unpunished. All of their sins were punished. But God made him who knew no sin to be sin so that Lot, his daughters, David, you, and me could become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. So let's not be too hard. Let's not be too hard on Lot. Let's not be too hard on David. Let's not be too hard on anybody in the scripture. Why? Because whom God sets free is free. Indeed, you and I have, and I have been freed by the grace of God, but yet we still think crazy. Do I have a witness in the building? Amen. So if God's grace is good enough for you, shouldn't it be good enough for them? Aren't we the fellowship of the forgiven? You can't be forgiven unless you've done something. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. And that love includes his grace. Our God is an awesome God. This is what I'm saying. Lot and his daughters were declared righteous because they, as Abraham, believed God. Doesn't the Bible say if you have faith as a mustard seed? It didn't say the size of a mustard seed. It says as a mustard seed. Mustard seed faith will justify you in the eyes of God. You are not justified. You are not declared righteous because of anything you have done. Anything you're doing right now. Or anything that you will do in the future. You are declared right with God because he decided to give you the ability. The Bible says that no one can come to me unless my father enables. What is the enablement of God? The grace of God. No one can come to me unless my father enables him to do it. And so because he has enabled you to do it, his grace means, by his grace means that he is, has been, and forever was committed to ensuring that you are saved. But for the grace of God, that's what it means. They were declared righteous. How will you declare righteous? Because you believe God. We are justified by faith alone. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, but with a faith that does not come alone. It comes with new works because of the grace and the faith. Boy, I wish I knew that years ago. Would have saved myself a lot of trouble trying to be right in and of myself. Believe in the nonsense that the only way you get to heaven is if you live right, do right, be right. No, 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 no. The only way you get to heaven is through faith in Jesus Christ alone. And that faith changes you. You become a new creature. God has to make you a new creation. And behold, all things have passed away. All things become new. And your behavior changes. The way you think changes. The way you feel about certain things changes. The way you feel about being around certain people, amen, changes. Bad company corrupts good morals. And don't we know that to be true? Now, Jesus spoke a parable to illustrate both his common and saving grace. In Matthew 13, verse 24 says, Jesus presented another parable to them saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat, and they went away. Verse 26. But when the wheat sprouted and bore grain, then the tares became evident. They became evident also. You couldn't tell the difference between grain and the tear until the head showed itself. 
until it matured. That's why the Bible says lay hands on no men subtly. Don't lay your hands on someone subtly. Just because someone comes into the fellowship and they seem to be talented and they seem to be a Christian, let them sit. You'll learn just how humble they are when you let them sit. Let them sit. Get to know them and let them get to know you. But many times, how many times you go to church and say, you need to get plugged in. You need to get close. You need to serve. Or not. No, no, no. Sit yourself down. <laughs> because busy doesn't mean that you're holy. Why in the world do we try? To, Jesus said, come unto me, all you that labor and the heavy laden, I will give you rest. And the first thing you want to do for people is put them, in, put them to work. Can't even hear the word of God because they're rubbing hither, hither and yon. Oh, we got an usher meeting tonight at seven. We got a deacon's meeting. We got this meeting. Stop with all the meetings. Just be Christians. Amen. Amen. If you preach, you know, you know something. Fun. I love John MacArthur says this. If you preach a hard message, you will get soft hearts. We preach the word of God the way it is. You get soft hearts and we get soft hearts. People love each other and things happen naturally. I'm sure glad, glad you all don't call me to have a bunch of meetings. I'm sh so glad. Oh, y'all don't know. I'll be here as long as God tells me to stay here. And I have a sneaky suspicion that's going to be forever until he closes my eyes. Amen. Amen. I ain't gonna, why in the world would I go out here to have meetings and boards and have to deal with people who don't love God, committees? And I ain't don't. Like I told Pat this morning, this is just a look. I ain't crazy. Mm -mm. Verse 27 of Matthew 13. The slaves of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? That's a question we ask. Don't we? Wait a minute. God, do you want us to get rid of all these people now? It's not just in the church. We, let, me, let me just straighten this out here. This doesn't mean you let ungodliness grow in the church. The world, the kingdom of heaven means the domain of God, which he has the whole world in his hands. That's the kingdom of heaven. He is ruler over it all. And so that doesn't give license. Well, you know, just leave him alone. You know, God will take care of him. Uh, yes, he will. And he's created instruments to take care of them with. That's us. People say, don't judge. Oh, we're going to judge. I'm not going to put you in hell, but you don't know about yourself. Can you imagine? Is someone stepping on your toe? I mean, hard. And you say nothing. I just don't, don't want to judge him. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that crazy? Can you imagine someone coming in here and all of a sudden they take a spray can and they start writing graffiti on the wall? Can you imagine saying, no, 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 leave him alone. We can't judge them. Isn't that crazy? No, judge, you have to judge all the time. It's just you have to judge rightly with the purpose of bringing them to Christ. Verse 28. And he said to them, an enemy has done this. The slave said to him, do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, no. While you are gathering up the tares, you may uproot the wheat with them. Uh-oh. Oh, some of us look like tares. Amen. And because of the grace of God, he said, no, no, no. Don't rip up the tares because you might get some of the wheat along with the tares. We see here that God's grace temporarily protect, protected the tares from eternal destruction. Isn't that what's going on today? You look at how... How in the world can these people blaspheme God and still be walking tall? It's the common grace of God. His patience. Because even some of them will be saved. Couldn't that be said about you? I know it could be said about me because I had terror tendencies. But praise God for his grace. But for the grace of God. Now, his grace protected the wheat from being destroyed along with the tares. Verse 30. 
He said, allow both to grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather up the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. Remember Sodom and Gomorrah, to burn them up. But gather the wheat into my bars. The wheat's gone home. God's grace towards sinners has a predetermined expiration date. But Jesus' patience and his grace towards the wheat is eternal. Verse 37. And he said, the one who sows. Now he's giving a, he's, he's, he's telling them the meaning of the parable. And he said, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. Grace. And the field is the world. And as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom and the tares are the sons of the evil one. Genesis 3, 15, God told the serpent, you will have your seed and I'll have mine. Your seed, mine. But people say it's up to you to choose. No, God said from the very beginning, your seed, mine. Jesus told the Pharisees, you are not of my, you are of your father, the devil. You are the devil's seed. I came to save my seed whom my father planted in the world. Aren't you thankful that he made you good seed? Who did it? He did it. Verse 39. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. And the harvest is the end of the age. And the reapers are the angels. Not us, but the angels. Verse 41. The Son of Man will send forth his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom. Remember, he said the kingdom of heaven. God is in control. So we see that he's talking about the whole world. And they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks who were showed common grace. And those who commit lawlessness, who are shown common grace. And I will throw them into the fiery furnace. When the common grace reaches its expiration date, you know, in a bottle, you look at the bottle and there's a definite date. Isn't that right? Jesus said, no one knows the date. Not even he knew. He said, but the father knows God is not waiting for you to finish anything. God is not waiting for the church to finish preaching the gospel to come. He has already set a date and there's nothing that can be done to change that date. If we could change the date and if God's dependent upon us for anything, he's not God. And we'll throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Verse 43, then who? The righteous. Who are the righteous? Whom God planted. The wheat. The wheat. Whom God planted. Not only did he plant them, he protected them. Didn't he say, no, 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 no. Don't, no, 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 don't, don't pull them out. Because you might pull out some of the wheat with the tares. He not only plants you, but by his grace, he protects you. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of God. Their father. Can you say in the kingdom of our father? Now let's make it even personal. In the kingdom of my father. Let's say that. In the kingdom of my father. He who has ears, let him hear. Well, I'm here to tell you, it is God who's by his grace, he has given you ears to understand. If you're a believer today, you've heard and you understand. You understand that by God's common grace, he saved you from all kind of predicaments. But the most important thing, but for the grace of God, he saved you from sin. He saved you from the pendulum that was swinging, that was about to strike you, the wrath of God. He saved you by his grace, grabbing you out. And now he is saving you, keeping you saved by that very same grace. And when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun and what will we sing amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me and you we once were lost but huh, now we're found how by grace was blind but now we see how by grace that's why his grace is amazing but for the grace of God none of it would have happened How great is our God. Sing with me how great 
is our God, and all oh, see how great, how great is our God. Those are just words. It's the truth. And we have to settle on that. We have to be settled on that in our spirit, that it is well with our soul, that God loves us in such a way that he will never leave you. Some of us in here have been forsaken by people. You've been hurt by people. The world has let you down. Even the church has let you down. But I'm here to tell you, I came to give you some good news this morning. God will never let you down. He's your child. You are his child. He is your father. He will never let you go. He hears everything you say. He knows exactly how you feel. He understands loss because for a little time, by his own design, he lost his own son to sinful men, but he allowed it. And because he did it, he raised him up. And because he raised Jesus up, he will raise you up too. Peter perfectly expresses what but for the grace of God means for believers. First Peter 1 verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his great mercy, mercy is not deserved. Remember, mercy, if it's old, it's not mercy. Who, according to his great mercy, has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. In other words, Jesus' resurrection sealed the deal. God said, oh, it's paid. It's finished. Jesus finished paying. He paid it all. But when he got up, that was a declaration by his father. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. To obtain an inheritance which is an imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away. Reserved. You got a reservation. Reservation in heaven. Reserved in heaven for you. Who are protected by the power of God. What is that power? The enabling power of his grace. Through faith. You see how that theme comes all the time? By grace through faith. Grace through faith. I know I say it all the time, but the Bible sees it. You see it again right here. Grace through faith. Grace through faith. God's enabling. He gives us the faith. Who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And what is that salvation? It is the salvation of our bodies. Your soul is as saved as it's ever going to be. But it is serving a life sentence incarcerated in this flesh. But when Jesus comes, the trump shall sound and the dead in Christ will rise first. <laughs> and those of us who are alive will be caught up to meet him in the air. And in what condition will we be caught up? We'll be caught up with the same body that Jesus Christ had after he rose. He had a body, I've said this often, but he was able to have a fish breakfast. He ate fish. He was able to eat, and he was able to walk through walls. He was able to be here one place, one minute, be somewhere else the next minute. There was no sickness or disease. His body can hmm, his body cannot die. Cannot. Don't you want a body like you, you want to put it in an order for how many want to put it in an order for a body that can't die? Huh? I want to tell you, your order has already been fulfilled because God reserved it before you, before the foundation of the world. And he's protecting you now so that you are insured to get it. That's why I get excited. How God is good. But for the grace of God, we'd be just lost as lost can be. But because of the grace of God, we have a living hope and we are alive today in Christ Jesus. Amen. 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 Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for again revealing to us through your word the truth. You said if we abide in your word, we would know the truth and that truth will set us free. I pray that those who are listening, who have listened to this message, that my brothers and sisters are being set free every week, every day as they study the word of God. Lord, thank you for freeing us to be who you've called us to be, your children. 
Lord, we give you honor. We thank you for your grace today. And may our lives reflect that grace that you might be glorified in and through us. We pray and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.